everyone, Kathy here and welcome back to my channel. Today, my interview will sound quite different as my guest will not be speaking on the microphone. Thomas Donnelly, born in 1893, died on 24 April 1971 after living a life full of passion and devotion, of love and sorrow, of happiness and despair, and of wealth and poverty. About a year and a half ago, I was writing a thesis on the painters of the Great Depression, and I accidentally discovered this rather unknown but fascinating artist. So today, I have the pleasure to introduce you to a brave and honorable man who loved his wife and his art more than life itself and used his immense talent to serve his country during the First World War and the Great Depression. So, grab a cup of coffee, sit back and relax while listening to Steve Sniffen read you Thomas Donnelly's fascinating life from a first-person point of view. Enjoy this special moment. I was born of Irish descent on February 25th, 1893, and grew up in Washington, D.C., where I obtained my bachelor's degree from the Corcoran School of Art. In 1915, I moved to New York City to pursue my education and to launch my career as an artist. I studied at the Art Student League of New York with artists John Sloan and Boardman Robinson as my professors, and later on, I became member of the board. In 1917, I was drafted to the armed services under the Artists of the War Commando and joined World War I until the armistice. Back in New York City, I rapidly became a well-known regional artist among the art connoisseurs of the city for my landscapes, coastal scenes, portraits, and still life paintings. I was exhibited in museums, fairs, and cultural events all around the city. As a young and talented artist, I had lived in an upscale apartment in downtown Manhattan at 449 West 22nd Street for 16 years in the neighborhood called Chelsea's Best Block for its vibrant life and its proximity to the New York Art Gallery District. My work was exhibited at the Brooklyn Museum, Carnegie Institute, Corcoran Gallery of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, New York Museum of Modern Art, and many others. And even though I was living the American dream in the heart of the city that never sleeps, I was also spending a lot of time in the suburbs where I would paint and find peace. My responsibility as a painter was to give tribute to nature and to bring the rural neighborhoods into the city. On a summer day of 1923, I drove through a little town located in the heart of Westchester County. I stopped my car near the Welcome to Valhalla sign, carefully sharpened my lithographic crayons and my charcoals, and slowly immortalized the village on a piece of paper. On this very same day, I fell in love with the little village of Valhalla. Today, my sketch overlooking Valhalla is part of the Whitney Museum of American Art's permanent collection. In 1925, I met Eve Colligan, a 23-year-old young English lady aspiring to become an artist. After dating for a few months, we quickly got married and built our first home in Valhalla. The four-bedroom house was located less than an hour away from New York, right next to the reservoir and the dam, 44 Howard Avenue. We built it big enough to welcome a family. We had it all planned. I would frequently commute to the city for my exhibits. And I would come home at night to my family and would continue painting the countryside while my sweet and beautiful bride would take care of our children and exercise her love for the arts. Little did we know that we had invested in a house that would soon become a financial burden. The Roaring Twenties were about to come to an end and the stock market was about to crash. On 29 October, 1929, the biggest financial crisis in American history abruptly hit the country. Driving my artwork to remain unsold, our bills to accumulate and our quality of life to collapse. At first, the American people believed in their new president. He was a self-made man and promised that the crisis would not last. But President Herbert Hoover refused to assess the amplitude of the depression and ultimately left the White House with 17 million people starving in the streets. During the first two years of the depression, from 1929 to 1931, 
I was still surrounded by some of the most powerful people in New York City who were willing to support me. I had met Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, a multimillionaire sculptor and patron of the arts while living in Greenwich and had become one of her protégés. In 1931, Mrs. Vanderbilt Whitney opened the Whitney Museum of American Art to focus exclusively on the art and artists of this country and made me an early contributor to the Whitney Club and one of the first of the Whitney Museum of American Art. But her generosity was not enough to keep me and my bride abreast. Because of the depression, my clients could no longer pay for my artwork. Within a few months from my last exhibit at the Whitney Museum of Art in 1935, I became a distant celebrity with scarcer visits to New York City and exhibits more locally based. My art would no longer appear in the museums downtown Manhattan, but they would be hanged in local schools, town halls, and hospitals. When President Theodore Roosevelt was elected in 1932, he launched many local and statewide programs for artists as part of his New Deal. I took advantage of all the projects available to me and multiplied the exhibit all around the nation. Among them, a Washington exhibition of 1934, displaying my landscape end of winter which was later purchased by the U.S. Department of the Interior for the White House. In June 1934, I finally ran out of funds and wrote a desperate letter to Forbes Watson, the technical director in charge of the art program of the Work Progress Administration, and to President Roosevelt himself, begging them to implement a strong federal project that would replace the local programs and would truly help the struggling artists such as myself. My multiple letters did not remain unread, and when the Federal Art Project of the Works Progress Administration was finally launched in August 1935, I immediately became a proud federal employee. For $40 a month, my job was to embellish America and paint the American scene on public buildings. I also became a member of the American Congress of Artists and signed the Call for American Artists Congress in New York City to help preserve and develop the American cultural heritage. I gave art lessons to children in my community under the Federal Art Project and even gave them exhibitions at the Model Girl Scout headquarters in New York. On April 23rd, 1938, the New York Sun gave tribute to my work and I quote, there is no faddish nonsense in the landscape work of Thomas Donnelly, now on view in the Marie Harmon Gallery. It is straightforward, honest, and sincere. In addition, it is well painted in a solid manly style, and the methods of the painting are so well covered up that you do not think of them. I do not hear particularly loud praise of this artist as being shouted from the rooftops. This convicts us of hypocrisy. In 1939, I became an international figure when I was exhibited at the 19th International Art Exhibit in Venice and at the World's Fair in New York City. But when the Federal Art Project closed its door in 1943, I never went back to New York City as a famous artist, as my regionalist style was no longer in passion. Instead, abstract expressionism was the new genre of the after-war with Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, and Mark Rothko as their avant-garde leaders, who painted subjective, emotional expressions. The decorative murals and canvas designed for the masses have been replaced by a new style called the all-over composition with colors and forms floating in space. The most famous museums, such as the Museum of Modern Art or the Solomon Art Guggenheim Museum, would invite European artists to come to New York, making the United States the new international platform of the arts and leaving social realist and regionalist artists once more without a job. On September 16, 1948, Eve, my sweet and beloved bride of 22 years, died at the early age of 45 years old, leaving me devastated. We were never blessed by children, so I felt alone in my big and empty house. From then on, I refused all invitations from the major institutions and became a part-time school teacher at Valhalla Public School and a jury in the local art contests, such as the Westchester Arts and Crafts Guild show in White Plains. I finally remarried 18 years later and transferred part ownership of my property to my second wife, Wanda. And at last, on April 24th, 1971, after a long and full life, I, Thomas Holman Donnelly, the World War I veteran, the talented New Yorker, 
the artist of the Great Depression, and the local resident of Valhalla died peacefully at the age of 78 years old in my home. Within a few months, my widow sold my beloved residence and moved out of Valhalla. She did not leave much behind but a simple plate in Valhalla Cemetery, located as far away from Eve's headstone as she could. Today, my legacy resumes itself as a tombstone lost in the cemetery, a few olden murals washed out by the years, and two dusty boxes of documents stored in the archives of Syracuse University. And now, this podcast. Wow, Steve, that was so beautiful. Well, I thank you for the opportunity. And it's <laughs> exciting for me. So well. I've been through Valhalla, and it's a lovely town indeed. And I've, I've learned so much, Kathy. It's, uh, it's lovely, and it's wonderful to learn more of the history of it. And it's been a pleasure to be with you. Like Thomas Donnelly, tens of thousands of other artists struggled, survived, lived, and then strived during the Great Depression, as their passion never died with the economic distress. They painted each day and tried new styles, genres, and techniques. They exhibited their art in museums, schools, hospitals, and libraries. They became mentors, taught art to children and adults, and they made America colorful again, transforming the dark decade of the 1930s into the best memories of their lives. That's it for today. I really hope you enjoyed hearing about Thomas Donnelly as he became one of my very favorite painters. I do feel very humbled by his life and his passion for the arts, but above all, I can't help but feel captivated by his courage and his love for his sweetheart. Thanks again, Steve, for all your help. That was unbelievable. Wonderful. Thank you. If you are interested in participating in one of our future recordings, if you have questions, if you want to give tribute to one of your loved ones, or if you would like to share your adventure with us, please do contact me at bbonclody at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode and always remember to love your life. Thank you, Steve. Have a great day.